this week's podcast. I'm super pumped. Back in the house is Dr. Craig Duncan. How are you, mate? I am fantastic, Greg, and I'm so happy to be back here. First time in 2022. I know. It's it's been a while. And you've just finished another course, Masters in Leadership, and we're going to have a chat about that right now. What is a good leader? What is a leader? What should a leader do? And what does it really mean to be a leader? Yeah, no, it was was really interesting. I thought that I was doing a fair bit of leadership coaching, and I just had this thing, well, it's probably good that I go and formally study it rather than think that I actually know it. Yeah, because you Um, you need more qualifications. (laughs) uh, (laughs) Let's rip into this podcast. Welcome to the Body Science Podcast. As always, the information contained in this podcast is for the information purposes only and is not designed to diagnose or be prescriptive to treat, prevent, or manage any injury, disease, or other health-related condition. Welcome to Body Science HQ, the world of fit, happy, and healthy. And this week on Dr. Craig Duncan, how are you, mate? I'm fantastic. And so It's so great to see you. I can't yeah. tell you, you always make me feel good when I see you. Oh, that's awesome to hear. Mate, so can you just give us a little bit of a background about yourself? Like you've just done another master's in leadership. I mean, mm. let's talk about your qualifications leading up to that so anyone listening goes, okay, he's in the right space for where I'm at. <laughs> yeah, well, I started like many people listening to this. You know, I loved being physically active and, and all that and, and was, a, was a soccer player, but then thought this is not going to become a, a professional professional endeavor. So I studied uh, sports science or back in my day, it was human movement science, you know, because mm-hmm. I just thought that would be great to be able to make people bigger, stronger and faster. And then uh, I studied that and enjoyed it uh, immensely and then went into postgraduate work in the sports science uh, area and then did my PhD in sport and exercise science. But working in sport and, and that I realized that there was other aspects of performance. And so that made me want to and to have a I have a real interest in psychology so I studied that and psychotherapy as well and then yeah so some more work in leadership that I've just done now so it's all been very enjoyable I enjoy studying, Greg. Mate, can you fit all your qualifications on a card these days? Like if you hand a business card out, does it all fit? Oh, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think about it too much. So no. I don't have a business card. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Look, <laughs> let's rip in. I, I, I want to talk about leadership and its impact on well-being, and we can focus on the workplace here because COVID, mm. COVID's been around. We've been out of workplace. Workplace scenarios have changed. We're coming back into work now. It's probably a great time to talk about, you know, the state of well-being at work. You're like. Where do we sit with leadership in this space? Well, that, it's, a, it's a great question. So I have a real interest, like I want to combine my interest in leadership with, you know, my background, which yep. is which is well-being. So well-being at work is a, is a real problem, uh, you know, with employees. And so I, I went back and started researching the impact leaders have on employee well-being, and it is substantial, Greg. Is that uh, right? And yeah, it's absolutely right. And my my idea or my hypothesis was that it would be quite quite important. And I've always had a problem that well being programs that people might have done or or interventions or cultural interventions uh, that organisations uh, go about, most of them actually don't really work. Uh, they might work for a small amount of time, but long term they don't make a huge difference to the organisation. What happens is people get a a, a bit of excitement. And they start being on their best behavior for a small amount of time and then then things just go back to back to the status quo and for me after spending so much time in professional sport the culture in that sort of uh, domain is driven by the leader like the coach yep. and I believe it's the same in the workplace and actual fact it is uh, so very much working in the corporate space, I often see these well-being programs done and they're targeted at the employees and the leaders aren't there. But in actual fact, what I'm hearing from the people when we do the research is the problem is the leader. And so in effect, we need to start with the leader first uh, so they can uh, see some of the issues that are going on in their own life and how they're performing and the impact that's having on their employees. Because research shows absolutely 
absolutely. Toxic culture often comes from the leader, you know, the, the negative environment, the impact it's having on people's mental health that are employees, relationship with the leader is quite strong. So, mate, like just touching on that a little bit, you, you've mentioned some words like toxic leadership and things. I, I understand the aspect when you, when you use words like that, like that's pretty clear, toxic is toxic. But mm. from, from you, you talked about a lot of the research is showing that toxic leadership, what research are we talking about here when you're when you're going on this track of culture, toxic leadership, a lot of it doesn't exist at the higher level because we're trying to train middle management and staff all the time and keep them happy without working mm. on the leader. I assume that's where you're at. Like the leader is the one throwing the dollars out to get people in. So he's thinking, I'll do people around me because that ticks a box that I've got. To- yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. Like it, like you're a leader in your organization, but yeah, you, you run the business. There's other leaders as well. You've got leaders below you that have their own team. So we're talking about those teams. And where does this research come from? It comes from the, you know, the published uh, uh, literature in, you know, uh, that has has scientifically been accepted in peer-reviewed journals. Mm -hmm. So it's good quality research. However, I do believe that there's there's a hole in the research that we can do much better. Uh, So it's really looking, you know, taking an organisation such as yours, interviewing the people, looking at, you know, the the outcome and how they're they're finding their situation on a day-to-day basis and rating the leadership, etc., etc. So there are some holes in that research. But overall, what has been identified uh, is that it's very important that the leader knows the impact that they can have on their subordinates or their or their followers. So it's just not leaders like you, company owners, company directors. It's all the way through an organisation that, that we have to, okay. have to yeah have to be aware of. And Craig, from that perspective of coming in and looking at um, the state of well-being in the workplace with that that leadership do should the leadership group work together in its learnings or do, does it have to be a really personal approach like say you just talked about several levels of leaders and we have and mm. look we're a small company 45 people and you, oh here's a stat for you mate did you know that over 37 percent of our staff are 10 plus years now oh, it's incredible yeah, but can you believe that that's, mm. i can yeah anyway. because i think i think you guys are wonderful leaders uh you and nathan are and and just your leadership your core leadership and Cherie involved in there as well. Everyone is 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 wonderful leaders, and you know you really are my, if not one of my favourite Australian companies. And you know how much I I like body. So I'm not surprised at all. That's an incredibly powerful statistic that we should be very proud of. And in actual fact, I think body science could be a very good case study in respect to uh, culture and organisation and how you've gone about that. We've got quite a few eight years coming through too. So that stat's going to get better and better, I think. Mm. Mate, so so going back to my where, where I was before I got all excited about our own stats and I apologise everyone for that. <laughs> when you talk about leaders, like we've got leaders in um, like our d- dispatch team, then we've got, you know, um, upline managers, then we've got managers of divisions and then obviously board level stuff. Should the management team be working to educate together or should we be looking at each of people individually or should we be looking at the level of compliance in that management role when we start to put these programs together with people like you? That's a fantastic question. I believe all leadership starts with self-leadership. Yep, okay. And every person listening to this now, if you're saying, oh, well, I'm not a leader. Yeah, you are because you need to take ownership and lead yourself. So at the very least, you're leading yourself. So I believe, and that's where I start with the, with my, you know, sort of self-science philosophy is we must start with ourselves. And so, yeah, I, in our leadership programs, we start with a real focus on, on self and leading oneself. And interesting enough, that comes up in the, in the research as well about the self-aware leader and how positive that has an impact on an organization. Mate, what is a self what is a self-aware leader? What does that mean? Well, well Greg, you tell me and you know we Oh, here we go exam often. time with Dr. Craig. Yep. No, yeah, no, <laughs> but but, uh, but we've had a, a number of conversations. Okay, uh, about this and sometimes and you are a very good leader. I know that. Are there days when you've reflected on your leadership and you've gone, "Jeez, I, that wasn't fantastic. Not the best version of myself. They're the days I give you a buzz, mate. <laughs> yeah. So, so, t- so, so what happens? So tell me what happens there. You wake up in the morning. Oh, look, it's very easy as a leader to strap the ego on and walk in based on how you're feeling. You know what I mean? Because you know that no one's going to have any recourse against you or any accountability against you because you're the leader. So you can walk in, not say hello to everyone, come to the door, shut it and just give that woo. Cause you know, I walk through the factory and I fist pump everyone on the way in, have a chat. How is everyone going on the way through? And 
and I make myself do that every day. I don't want to do it every day because as someone who's um, been profiled a lot, because we do a lot of that in our business, I'm the person who just wants to come and get shit done. And I mean, that I work with you, with Luke, like there's a heap mm. of people that have been really good to me in that space. But that's, it's really easy for me to walk in straight out the back, straight through the middle not say a word to anyone, come and shut my door. And Absolutely. Yeah, I get that. Now, there has been some days like that where you do absolutely, that. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Are you aware that that's not the, that's not the best thing for the organization? Absolutely. I've probably told myself that as I get out of the car. Yep. And I'm definitely, once I've shut the door and I come in, I'm definitely sitting down and I reflect. I make sure I reflect every day when I sit down at my desk. And like I do when I, you, I mean, you've got me in this habit of when I get out, you know, wake up in the morning, the things that I do, you know, feet on the ground, three things that I'm thankful yeah. for, stick your head under a cold shower. You know, those things that you've got me you're doing, I, I, I do the same version when I come to work because that that's my life when I'm at home. But when sure. I come to work, I've got to do the same thing because I'm not, let's have a coffee and talk shit, Greg, I'm coming to work and I've got what I want to do so for me i do this i do a, a similar thing when i come in every day i reflect as soon as i sit down i make myself do that yeah. and that's also about aligning myself and my calendar you know not getting caught up in emails not getting caught up in all the crap that can just be white noise and destroy a person's day you know part of that reflecting is you know what, I, what am i really what's my red frog for the day you know what am i really biting into and nailing today so i do that but i, I those days that you're talking about right there and i haven't taken a breath so i'm gonna take one right now because you've obviously <laughs> yeah. pushed some buttons on me which you, you know how to do you're really good at that <laughs> well well <clears throat> I sit you down and go, I mean, yeah, yeah, I sit down and I went, you know what? That's not the best version of yourself, Greg. And that's a classic Luke line, you know, like Luke Mathers wrote Stress Teflon. That's his, what's your best version of yourself there, Greg? Because he challenges me on that type of stuff all the time too. So yes, I do have those days like everybody else. Um, well, well, you've answered the question very well because the, the, the reason I just got you to do that was you asked me what is self-awareness? That is self-awareness. Yeah, okay. And the, the most basic thing of self-awareness is recognizing yourself in the mirror. Yep. Okay. Um, and I I think self awareness is about sitting back and having the ability to reflect. Look, we're never going to be perfect or anything like that, but knowing when we're outside what we think is you know that that best version of ourselves or how we should conduct ourselves to get the best out of our people, that's having that self awareness. Interesting enough, you're a very self aware person. You're you're an empathetic person. You've got high emotional intelligence. Many 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 leaders don't so what they do they don't even go through that thought process they come in they lock themselves in the office that is it they don't think there's anything wrong with that they they might go out um you know rip into someone and have a go at them about something they don't think there's a problem with that they go back into their office and off they go and then we've got a whole stream of followers just hating their life and hating their workplace so i'm speaking here now to you who's a very very self-aware high emotional intelligence, a leader that wants to be better. Let me say that um, many, many leaders are not in that category. So that's what it's about. We must start first with getting people to be more self-aware and the, um, and know that the power and the impact that they are having on the people that are working for them. Mate, is it from, to, to flip that over, those days where a leader comes in and, and I mean, if you're a toxic leader, it does this every day, and I'm not talking about that, but some, when you come in on those days, is it bad for the team to know that you're having a bad day? Well, I think you'll you'll find <laughs> absolutely because the the thing is, it's like a a parent, uh, you know, a parent that's always angry and that sort of thing. As a kid growing up, that's going to be quite difficult for you in a in a organisation where you've got an angry leader or a person that's uncomfortable in their own self and there's everything always going wrong. It's just an uncomfortable environment. And would you want to turn up to that? No, not really. Yeah, and there's a lot of people. I, you know, I go to corporate places all the time. And where people are unhappy in the workplace. Now, we spend over 30% of our, our life in the workplace. Mm. No one wants that and no one deserves that. Interesting enough, some people say to me, is it, Craig, is it our responsibility as an organization to look after the mental health and well being of our people? That's a really that's good a, question. That's what people uh, say to me all the time. It's a big chunk of time. Yeah, so it's 30% of your time and they're asking. The organization is saying, should we spend money on this area? I get that. You know, you've got, uh, you know, shareholders, you've got board members asking, well, you know, it's not our job. We're a we're a supplement company or we're a health company. We're not a we're not into the well being of our our people. They're here to work. We're paying them a wage. I hear this often. Well, my answer to that is absolutely. It is in your best interests. 
because happy people, healthier people are more productive yep. and they will give you more. And then hence you get over 35% of your staff st- uh, staying over 10 years because you know what? It's very expensive to employ people to have this merry-go-round of pushing people out and getting new people in, training them. That's expensive. So I think it's a it's an interesting question when people ask me that and it's an easy answer for me because time and time again you can show if you work on your people they will be more productive they will stay longer they will buy into what you want them to do a culture will be wonderful and overall you what every business is made for to make profit you will get more profits because of that you'll have less sick days you'll have less you know there's so much problems with people just being at work and not doing anything mm-hmm. or what we call presenteeism that's that's all cultural issues and what concerns me is we have these culture gurus come in and they don't they don't <laughs> meet really the needs of did you see that i was being self-aware i, there I know you're I being very self-aware you're about to unload they, i picked really, up on that they really don't don't make a long-term <clears throat> impact a positive impact on the organization and, because yeah and so you're you're sort of saying that you think leadership is the number one driver in culture like i'm getting this this constant yes. rebound back to culture over and over again Yes. So it's yes. not it's not Google with its um cafes and its pinball machines and its um, table tennis tables. It's leadership. Well, that started with leadership as well, hasn't it? Because the leaders have uh, are open enough to do the research and go, okay, well, this might might make a difference in this organisation. Um, and so that's that's what we've got to look at. Yeah, it, for me, it all starts with leadership. Leadership drives the culture. Um, Self aware leaders are, are vital, uh, and working on the leaders generally, I think is is so important for any organization and and that's just not the the c-suite that's just not the corporate leaders yeah. because let me say this what happens is so say you're you uh, a person you have that's leading uh, a team of five or six what training have they had in leadership so your c-suite has probably had some training Absolutely, in leadership yeah. somewhere along the line but what about your people below that have been normally they've been promoted because they're the best at their job they're the best at their their job they're really good at their job you see good things in them but then leadership is a different skill set and then off you go and then they then there's problems i see this all the time in professional sport you know you might have a very good strength and conditioning coach and then they now turn themselves a high performance manager they don't have the skill set because they've never been trained they've been trained in the sports sciences and this is where i suppose i'm a little bit different because i i saw that that hole in my myself and then went and studied psychology and leadership because i wanted to my skill sets changed you know but uh, i see it all the time in professional sport uh a A great player becomes a coach, but then can't manage the team. Well, it's not their fault. They haven't had the training. And that's why I think what what we're talking about here is this middle management and lower management is so important because they're at the coalface of a team. And that disgruntled team that could be in logistics can infiltrate and ruin your whole organization. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, mate, when someone comes to you and says, I've got a poor culture at work, what do you do? Like, how do you, how do you address that issue? Well, look, I always work from the from a model I, I I came up with called the Affirm model, and the first step is analysis. It's to try and find as much information as possible, basically to conduct an audit of what's going on, to get as much information as I possibly can, then to make a key uh, recommendations to the organisation to see where that's coming from. Because it's not as simple as that, you know, as a, mm. as a, a leader coming and saying, oh, we've got... <clears throat> massive problems with culture yeah okay well i could take that but i want more information that's just the the researcher in me to get to that you know to the bottom of it and by doing that you've got to look at a number of subgroups involved in that organization to come up with an outcome and then start to look at formulating a plan about how how to move forward yeah nice mate when you did your master's in leadership you know a lot of people actually talk, talk to me all the time about culture like did it define what culture is to you? Like, is there anything new in that space? Well, I, I really focused on leaders and well-being, and I didn't want to delve too deeply into the culture okay. um, of of you know organisations because I think they're 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 so related, and it's hard to to actually define culture. But I think you can define it 
by how people are and researching how people are in that business by by interviewing them and seeing how are they happy to come to work are they are they have they bought into the the values of the company you know, are they are they really striving to make that organization better that's what culture is for me you know are, like just waking up in the morning and wanting to come to the workplace rather than dying for Friday to come around <laughs> can you do both <laughs> i think you can because if you work hard and i know i know you promote this at body science you know if you work hard you to go out and enjoy your, your weekend because mm-hmm. you need to have that not to sit there on monday thinking i just can't wait to get through this because i don't enjoy my life through the week just think about that if you're listening to this think about that and think about that if you're running an organization five days in the week you don't want to exist because you want to get to saturday and sunday life is much more than that because we're just wasting so much time. So you've just done your master's in leadership and you focused on wellness, you said, like wellness and leadership were the two words you use. I got that right? Yeah, well-being, well-being, leadership, well-being, because that's the other thing I'm fascinated about, how well are leaders. And when you say well, well-being and uh, in that space, are you talking about health? Is, is that yes. is that where you're yeah. at? So. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, when I talk about well-being, I think of the holistic, you know, the human from a holistic perspective, the psychological and the physiological. So things, you know, it's fascinating, <clears throat> you know, when you start to look at sleep, exercise and nutrition, the key, the key components of, of well-being for me. And if you and you know how much I think about sleep, it's it's the foundation of all performance. And you look at the, the impact leadership often has on a person's sleep and I I am just in the midst of organizing a study to actually look at the sleep across, you know, large numbers of leaders to see are they actually getting the recommended amount of sleep and you know what is their their diet diet like and are they actually getting recommended daily doses of exercise. I can guarantee you my hypothesis would be the answer will be uh, surprisingly very poor. Now, if we look at that from a perspective of the whole self awareness and about being the best leader you can be. I do not believe that if you don't have those three areas of your life in pretty good, you know, good control, that you can be as maximize your effectiveness as a leader. Now, that might be controversial. Uh, but I don't mind being controversial, but you very ev- rarely read this in the management books when you look at leadership. They don't go back to these fundamental things. See, I'm coming from a different angle with leadership. I come from, you know, a health background and a performance yeah, background. Exactly. I'm not coming from a management background. So every time I look at the management and thinking, oh, are you doing X, Y, and Z? Well, hang on. The guy's 40 kilos overweight. He's getting four hours sleep a night. He's having 27 coffees before 1 p.m. and you're talking about oh can he do these things right get the basics right before we even go there yeah nice and i thought you would have had a fourth pillar on there like sleep exercise nutrition and something around that mental side oh I well thought, i think you know, yeah even, even like a decision making or whatever i thought you might have had a fourth well, those three, if you don't have those three, right, your your mental it acuity is, yeah. is going to be off. So, you know, for me, um, it all starts with sleep. That's why I talk about sleep so often, why it's so important, because even, look, if you don't sleep right, you're not going to eat right. Yep. You know, there's a high relationship between sleep and then what happens to your diet. You know, you start going for high fat foods and, you know, high carb, Comfort. high fat foods, Happy. you know, those sort of things if you don't get your sleep right. Yep. If you don't sleep right, you don't feel like exercising True. so that's why we need to get that right and if you do not have your sleep right your mental you know your mental health is not going to be positive either yeah that's that's a really interesting that's really interesting for someone like me to hear because when you talk about your hypothesis it would be that it would be poor in that space i would have thought it was fairly common knowledge these days to uh, leaders in business to you know, and I guess I'm very self science with you. You talk about self science all the time, mm. getting yourself right before you can help others. And I thought that would be like a 101 in leadership. If you've got any type of role in leadership first is to make sure you're doing what you need to do before you can lead anybody else. And obviously that's not true. I don't believe it is. Not mm-hmm. what I see. I, 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 I really don't. I think we don't touch on it enough in, uh, you know, management courses and that just how important this self-leadership is and not just in the technical skills. Get the physiology, get the psychology right before, 
you know, everything else will, will work in work in much better after you get those things right. And you can see it. I mean, look, I'll be very interested to publish this data, you know, when we when we get it, when we start researching and just the basics of, you know, what is the health status of leaders in Australia? I think we'll be quite interested. Yeah, that is cool. And mate, when you talk about sleep being the foundation of it all, like everything sort of hedges on sleep, mm. what, 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 what is the latest data on you know, I think your words were, if you're getting enough sleep, what is the latest data on what we should be aiming at? Oh, look, an adult uh, an adult should be getting seven to nine hours sleep a day. We really should be averaging around that eight hours sleep. Some people will say to me, oh, Craig, I can function on four hours sleep. I can do that. There's very, very few people that are genetically made up to act for that to actually happen. You might think that you can do that, but you don't realize what you're missing out on by by doing that. So seven to nine hours of, of good solid sleep, you know, really aiming for that eight hours a, a night on a regular basis, uh, not thinking that you can make it up on a, on a Sunday sleep in or anything like that. It's having a regular go to sleep time and a regular wake up time seven days a week. See, we live at the moment, people, people live in a constant jet lag. Wow, yeah, good way to put it. Big, yeah, because what they do is they have a sleep wake cycle during Monday to Friday and then Saturday and Sunday they're all over the place so every Monday that's why people don't feel great uh, because they're they're jet lagged Mm. so we are doing that to ourselves and like it's it's just so important poor sleep is you know it's got a relationship with diabetes type 2 heart cardiovascular disease obesity you know uh, mental uh, health issues as well anxiety if we don't get those things right you know with our sleep yeah we've got real problems so what are some of the things that it's really easy to say we should get out of our sleep and i'm lucky i sleep I mm-hmm. put my hand up what are some of the, the good practices here to look at for people who are struggling to sleep well fundamentally we start with what time do you need to wake up and to really identify what time you need to wake up to to get onto your day we've got really three types of chronobiology you know like three sort of uh, different sorts of people that will be listening to this those that really are a night owl that they they like to go to sleep very late and wake up later those that wake up very early like yourself Greg, you know like that yep. will go to sleep early and wake up very early at like 5 a.m and it'll be natural and they'll feel a million dollars and then the, most people fall into what we call uh, the third bird you know because we call the night hours larks are the ones that get up in the in the morning very early the third bird is the one that will, yeah we'll <laughs> wake up around seven before 8 a.m go to bed normally 10 p.m at night they're where most people fit in okay. and uh, so that's what you've really got to look at if you're on a normal work schedule uh that you'd probably go to sleep around 10 p.m or start getting ready for bed around 9 30 p.m get into bed around 10 p.m and then you'll wake up around you know 6 30 7 7 a.m uh, to get up to get get that time so that's one thing to have that very consistent routine in respect to your sleep when you go to sleep and when you wake up it's also important just to have the basics right in your in your in your room that it's very dark that you have it very very dark you eat, have it cool it's much better that the room is cool around 18 degrees celsius yes you can have your your blankets on but it's better you can throw them off rather than to have a warm warm room Mm -hmm. and that you try and keep electronics out of the the room as well so if you have your phone there just turn it over so there's no light uh, emitting from it because remember light keeps us away so those i'm amazed how many devices there are these days Mm -hmm. you take to your bedroom and they have those little green lights or the little red lights or the little blue lights and, and they light a room up it's just yes i run around with a black marker pen and i'm thinking why do they even bother doing this it's just yeah it's it, that is incredible actually it happened to me the other day like i wear the the aura ring you know which monitors my sleep and and i had another one that was on charge and i was thinking where is that light coming from <laughs> and it was just a tiny little light flashing on and flashing off so you've got to cover those up uh and and keeping the room nice and clean and 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 clear and uncluttered is important oh, okay. yeah that's important but, yeah but Dark, dark is good. Dark yeah, is very, good. very important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. Well, mate, that's been uh, it's been fun chatting. So the biggest thing that's come out of this masters in leadership you've done, and, and <laughs> what you're going to share with the world is self leadership, which is what you were pretty much promoting self science in the early days in itself. So there's a lot of selves in that 
sentence on yeah, yeah. For that, but. yeah there is I, I look i think you know the self-science philosophy and and self-leadership and self-awareness is so key there's there's three selves in that but it is it starts with us to make ourselves as best and this is not about us it's not like okay all about us no what i believe self-science was originally about was to make ourselves the best possible so we can go and make the world a better place yep. so we can reach out i gotta say like there's, there's just something that hit me so hard in the last couple of days we all know mental health is an issue but i i just saw this statistic that 800,000 humans globally every year uh, will die from suicide it's terrible one every 40 seconds and uh, like we know those, we hear those statistics, but one every 40 seconds. But even more important than that is that 90 percent of people that try to take their own life but fail at that attempt. So they survive that attempt over 90 percent. Never, ever die from suicide, which means they got that opportunity and they went and were able to live a life and die of other causes or, or just live that life. That for me is frightening when you put it into numbers that 90% of that 800,000, if there was just someone there to reach out, to stop them, to talk to them, to catch them before it happened somehow would have survived. And that's why I'm so big on getting ourselves right. And and it's not just asking others, are you okay? Every day it's asking yourself, are Absolutely, you okay? Absolutely, yep. So ask yourself, are you okay? And look, if you've got no one around you, you feel like you can reach out to, you, there are organizations to reach out, but just know, keep that in your mind that over 90% of people never go through with this. So that just upsets me so much that we are obligated I think, to try and make this world a better better place. And, and interesting, you know, you chatted about gratitude before, and I say, write down three things you're grateful for. It's interesting, that can work, but on some of the latest research in gratitude, you know what's even more important is receiving gratitude is a wonderful thing for someone, but we can't wait around every day to receive gratitude. Giving gratitude to someone else like going out and telling three people how how good they are, that'll make them feel better and will make you feel better. And you know what? Even in your reflection, I'd like you to start this, Greg, is reflecting on a time when you've seen someone do something or do an act of gratitude for someone else, that will impact you positively. Okay. So let's, you know, let's really think about that. And, and if you're a leader, tie this back into leadership. How often do you actually go to your people and, and and see how they are. I know you do. I'm not asking that. I'm asking people mm. out. Ask them how they are. Thank them for the work that they're doing and just being grateful for them. And trust me, I work at the highest level of pressure, you know, in, in sport. I get that when things are moving a million miles an hour, that it's difficult for you to do that. But I can't tell you how much a difference you will make to someone else's life when you actually do do that. Mate, it wouldn't even be 1% of your day if you're good at it. You mm -hmm. know, if you're like, and when I say good at it, I mean, you were, you, you were trained to make yourself do that regularly, wouldn't even take 1% of your day. And I guarantee you, you know, you will feel a lot better as, as well by doing that. Some great advice thanks for coming on mate it's always good talking to you really really enjoy it i'm looking forward to getting to sydney and catching up oh uh, yeah i can't wait to see you and by the way your products you, i just said to you the other day that new moose that you brought out <laughs> like uh, you know i i'm i'm going maybe an all body science diet don't do that at home by the way you need to eat food but yeah. <laughs> you, you live a very different type of eating to what most people do <laughs> so i can see what you're thinking and where you're going with it but, but mate thank you so much for coming on mate just thanks for being on i mean you just keep giving knowledge bombs to the team and i can't say thanks enough to appreciate it thanks greg thank you very 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 much catch you mate